We are here in uh, Columbia, Ohio, at the uh, 52nd mm -hmm. uh, reunion, 12th Armored Division reunion. I'm here with uh, Robert Payne. Do you prefer Bob? Or? Bob's fine. Okay. Um, my name is <clears throat> Michelle Colvin. It is August 30th, and uh, let's get started. Um, first off, why don't you just tell me where you were raised um, and when you were born? I was born in Baltimore in 1921, April 13th. Baltimore, that's Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you remember about your early life? Do you remember activities or where, did, were you on a ranch or? Uh... Oh no, we were, we were in the, uh, what was then known as the suburbs, but uh, actually it was a small, you call it a farmette, I guess, that my dad had and I was there until I was uh, ready to go to school. And then because the walk would have been too far, he moved into a, a different neighborhood, able to walk to school. And that's more like what you now call suburbia. So what was your or father's actual career? Or he went from having a dairy to getting into the Baltimore Transit Company. He worked for the Transit Company until he retired, but at one time he did own a dairy. Was he happy about the change? or? Was it for well, I was too little to know. <laughs> he sold the dairy, so I guess either competition was too much from major dairies or he just got tired of doing that. And maybe, you know, just not enough money in it. And then he went to work for a transit company. What was your mother like? Did she work? Typical housewife. Typical housewife. She was from Virginia. And, uh, of course, we didn't have very many working mothers then, so she was a stay-at-home mom, and uh, typical is what I can come up with. How many siblings do you have? I only had one brother who died before I was born. Oh, that's too bad. So you were, you got all the attention? For all practical purposes, I was an only child, yes. <clears throat> but I'll never admit to being spoiled. Um, what uh, do you remember, how did the, the uh, depression influence your family? Well, I'm sure it influenced them because things were tight, but my father worked the whole time. Uh, he was fortunate in that, and the, the transit company kept him going with uh, enough money for us to survive, and I, I knew no hardship. My mom and dad may have known it, but I didn't. Um, what education background did you complete? I got as far as high school and then took some courses uh, primarily because I was in uh, banking at the time at the University of Baltimore, but you couldn't really call it college uh, credit courses. And about the time we were getting out of high school, we were also getting into the service, so that kind of influenced me. How were you, how did, or when, what year did you, uh, did you become part of the service? Say that over. What year did you become part of the service? 1942, November 1942. Were you excited, or was it something that you felt you had to do, or? <laughs> Well, I guess everyone was excited thinking about it, but <clears throat> I think I was uh, under the impression that Hey, you have to do it, and if you're going to make me do it, I will, but if I had my druthers, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't be there. Because, you know, you didn't understand what it was all about. Go to Germany or wherever you were going to go, Japan. It was easier to maybe want to fight the Japanese than it was the Germans at the time, because after all, they had that sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, and the Germans kind of jumped in and said, me too, after war was declared. But... Uh, there were mixed emotions. Some people ran right down to the enlistment place and enlisted, and uh, some people, I guess, they thought they'd like to run some other way, and uh, the rest of us just waited until we had to go. I wasn't waving a flag then, <laughs> because uh, I didn't know. None of us knew what, what to expect. Um, what do you recall about hearing about Pearl Harbor? Well, I can vividly remember that because it was on a Sunday afternoon, and Sunday afternoon was a rest time, 
and I think I had actually fallen asleep on the sofa listening to radio, probably the Rep Washington Redskins or something. And I woke up when the announcement came on. And I think the general feeling with people my age was, number one, we're going to be in it. Number two, all we knew about war was what we'd probably seen in the movies from World War I. And I would not have been at all surprised if the Japanese had attacked Baltimore that night. You know, we were ready. And you really didn't realize uh, how hard it would have been for them to attack the main United States. But uh, the fear was there. The apprehension, I guess, is a better word than fear. So that's how we were. And then, you know, as time went on and President Roosevelt gave his famous speech and said, well, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, then it kind of calmed us all down and, and we uh, settled down to do what we had to do. Um, was your father involved in World War I? No, he was too old. What was his impression of it? Do you remember? Of World War I or the World War II? World War I. He didn't talk about it. Uh, he, was, he was too old to get in it, and uh, I really don't recall ever hearing him speak about it. Of course, I'd like all the kids, I asked him if he was in it, and he told me no, and that was the end of it. Um, so you got drafted, and where did you head to? Well, I think it was Camp Lee, Virginia, is the first place they sent us. And uh, you were there. I was there for, uh, see, I think I got there on a Monday or a Tuesday, and I left on Thursday. And uh, hauled us right into Camp Campbell. Biggest impression on that was, a, I believe he was a major that got on a train just before we got into Camp Campbell, and he said, all right, you all are in the armored forces now, so put your hat on the left-hand side of your head instead of the right. And that made us special right away. Good for him. That's a good way to get you started, isn't it? Yes, he did. So what was your impressions of Camp Campbell? How long were you there? I was there until the, until the division moved. Uh, they went on maneuvers, you know, right now I, I can't quote dates on that. I just let that go out of my mind. But once I hit Campbell, I was with the 12th, stayed with the 12th, moved with the 12th, and stayed over in Europe with the 12th. I came home with the 2nd. Um, can you remember the travel that you were probably in trains? You're going trains. there? Uh-huh. The most I remember about that was that uh, going through Kentucky was some of the most beautiful country I'd ever seen. You know, looking out the windows of the train, we and of course we went over the mountains, and uh, it was uh, that was the biggest impression I had. That there was no worry about you know where I'm going. They had me by that time, so that's that's the main thing that that I carry with me as a remembrance. That plus a major with his hat speech. So where did you go from Camp Campbell? We went, well, in the middle of Camp Campbell, they sent me off to, um, I went to radio school at Campbell, and then they sent a certain group of us to Fort Knox and had another session with radio school. But I was still attached to the 12th Armored mm -hmm. in Campbell and then came back to Campbell and moved with them to, after maneuvers, to, to Barclay. And what were your impressions of Camp Barclay? Well, it was, uh, I just liked the idea of being in Texas because we, you know, there again, you see all the movies about the Wild West movies and all in Texas, and I, I had a natural wonderment of what was Texas like, and uh, there I was in Texas. And, uh, you know, as much as you can enjoy that type of stuff, I enjoyed what we were doing and uh, the, um, the fact that we we were getting ready for something, but uh, as far as the weather was concerned, you know, that was nice. It was a lot different than Kentucky. The winter we spent in Kentucky was miserable as far as I was concerned. It was just too damp. But uh, Texas weather I thought was all right, even when it was hot. And um, what did you, what were you trained to do in Kent? 
I, was, I kept right on with radio. Uh, I had had those two courses in uh, Camp Campbell, and then I, I was part of the radio group in Barclay. This was in an armored car. It wasn't, uh, you know, like you'd think a radio now in a, in a building or something. It was in an armored car. Did you feel your training was sufficient? Yes. Uh, in both of those schools I went to, they gave you all the time that you needed and, and the instructors were good and they made sure that you knew what you were doing. So yes is the answer to that. Good. Okay. So from Camp Campbell, uh, Berkeley, you went to New York? Short stay in New York, yes. And how was the uh, trip overseas? With us, it was good because, as I recall, we were on. Uh, or it was uh, it was the the uh, and I can't think of it, but the the governing ship in the fleet that was going over the command ship or what have you, and we only had one contingent of troops, whereas the others, some of them, you spent one night on deck and the other night in the hole or in your bunk, and then back on deck. But we didn't have to do that, so we had uh, we had a kind of plush quarters in comparison with the others. And uh, you thought a little bit about maybe some German submarine was going to be out there and cause you a problem, but, you know, it was really a quiet trip over and uh, you couldn't dwell on that all the time anyhow. What did you do for entertainment? Are we still on the boat? Yeah. The ship? Yeah. <laughs> it is a ship, not a boat. I don't believe we had any entertainment. Uh, you entertained yourself because it was a case of, you know, you're there, you 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 go to eat three times a day, and you're pretty much on your own. You go up on deck if the weather permits and things of that nature. I don't remember. Of course, a lot of them, the entertainment was shooting crap or playing cards, but I wasn't good at either one. And I didn't have any money to do it with either, so I didn't get into that. Do you remember the, the feeling um, on the ship of the other soldiers? And was, was the majority of them like ready gung-ho to get over there, or were they a little intimidated, or do you recall? I, th I think neither. Uh, we didn't have people, the John Wayne variety, that was, when we get over there, we'll take care of them and all that sort of stuff. That's only in the movies anyhow, I believe. And, but there was nothing like, oh my golly, I'm going to be killed, I'll never see my family again. I'm sure people had those thoughts, but they didn't express them. They just kept them to themselves and, you know, talked about the girl back home or the letters she got or whatever, but she didn't get into that. At least the people I was with didn't. Did you have a girlfriend at the time? Yes, I did. Don't get into that too much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all did. Had somebody that you thought about. You know, in a way, if you didn't have a girlfriend to think about, you were missing something. You, were, you weren't complete at that time, I guess. But yes. Did you get, le did you get letters? Oh, yeah. yeah. They helped a lot. Yes, letters from, from your girlfriends, letters from friends, letters from your family. It's, it's, um, I think most people will tell you that if you were at mail call and you didn't get one, you really felt left out. You, there was a void there. And uh, Sometimes you get three or four, or sometimes only one, but if there was one there, that's what counted. So where did you land um, in Europe? Well, we were in England first. And uh, for a thousand dollars, I couldn't tell you where we were there, but you know, they said get off the ship, and so I got off the ship. And uh, it was someplace on a big hillside, and we were in tents while we were there and uh, just waiting. I guess it was a staging area, but I, I don't know where, where it was. I can't recall, anyhow. Um, so, what was your next? We just stayed there for a while. I got to see London. Went uh, was in the uh, Westminster Abbey and had the thrill of walking on Darwin's grave and a few things like that. All the other things were packed away. The the very valuable things that are in Westminster Abbey. 
and saw the changing of the guard and uh, what's a place where they had all of the shows was Piccadilly Circus. We all had to do that bit. And then we were shipped over and I think it was Le Havre that we landed in. And the first uh, assignment we had, our troop anyhow, is we supposedly were, there were some German troops still on some islands in the channel. And we were supposed to walk up and down or be alert as to whether or not they were trying to get off of there. And uh, they never tried. I don't blame them for not trying. The war was over for them. As long as they behaved themselves, nobody was going to bother them. But that was the first thing that we had. Um, what were the uh, living situations like, living quarters? Well, at first we were on the outside, uh, and I remember they, it was raining, they set us up in some field that was just nothing but mud. That's all it was to it. It was just one big muddy field. And we pitched pup tents, and you were wet all the time because it rained all the time. It had a big fire going in a barrel, and you could stand with your back to that barrel and dry off and the front's getting wet and then you turn around the other way and the back's getting wet, but we managed to survive. And uh, we were fortunate because somebody in the, you know, put the two pep, pup tents together or hold in four. And somebody went out and found some wood and we put the wood down on the ground and then the blankets and all on that. So we were reasonably dry, whereas some of the others weren't. And the ones that weren't Boy Scouts forgot to dig a trench around that pup tent so the water came in. But I was a Boy Scout so we had a trench and the water didn't come in. That was when we first got over there in, in Europe, uh, you know, France. Um, what is the next step in the experience you can remember after leaving there? Well, I guess it was when we started and uh, we were moving towards uh, what would be the front line and uh, there again, you didn't know what to expect. And my impression of it at that particular time was when they said, all right, you're gonna go into combat, that we'd go and we wouldn't stop until somebody surrendered or you got shot or something happened that you just keep on going. And I was really surprised when they pulled us back. So we were reconnaissance, we went out and I guess we found what we were supposed to find and then they pulled us back. And that was both good and bad because you felt you were ready to just keep on going. And then they let you come back. And then you had to get ready to go again. And then, they were, and then you were saying, well, come on, let's take us back, you know. And it, uh, it played a sort of a, a seesaw with your emotions on that type of thing. But, that's how they did it, and after a while we got accustomed to that. Because we just didn't have enough heavy armament to go ahead and stand up against German tanks at all. In a way, it was find them and run. We got good at that. Um, do, you, do you recall your, the first battle that you came across? Well, the first under fire, rather than the first battle, and that was the very first day that we were committed to, to uh, combat, and nothing happened close to me, so I was fortunate. But uh, frankly, I didn't know what was going on. I, they said we we're going to drive down here, and they tell the driver to drive, so he drove. I was part of what he was driving, so I went with him, and uh, that, that was the beginning. And then the, uh, for some reason, right after that, not too long after that, because I was in radio, they had, there must have been someone else with me from the troop, but I was assigned to one of the combat commands as a radio operator. And uh, I guess I was there maybe one or two days and taking messages from the outlying units into the combat command headquarters. and. Uh, I'll always remember the first message is we were under counterattack and we needed help. This is the message as it came in. And I gave it to some officer in there and they got things squared away, but that was my big message. So then they took us back, took the, they, I guess they gave up on that and, and I went back with the, with the unit. 
And um, explain how the how um, the orders came through. Explain what what you were involved with. Well, orders, as far as I was concerned, they came through from through some mysterious background there, and the lieutenant uh, that was in our armored car would go back with the staff sergeant, and they'd have a meeting with the captain and anyone else who was there. Then they'd come back, and the word I got was, okay, we're moving out, this platoon first, another platoon second, another platoon third, and they didn't tell me where they were going. Once in a while, they would give you some warning about, you know, if they start shelling, get off the road and go straight up or something. But I didn't know, you know, I just wasn't that high up. Uh, I was technician fourth grade because I was with the radio, and, and I guess by now you know a technician fourth grade was the same as a buck sergeant with his three stripes. And so they didn't have to consult me, they just told me. Did you enjoy your position, or was it? I mean, did you feel grateful that you weren't right there in the front line? Well, we were in the front wow. because of recon reconnaissance, you see. But <clears throat> we had that liberty, privilege, or whatever you want to call it, of when we found the enemy, that uh, by letting somebody else know where they were, who could better handle what was going on, we could pull back. And we didn't we didn't run all the way to the rear every time, but uh, we were able to notify where we had located any enemy positions, and then uh, heavy fire from tanks and so forth could take over on that. We just didn't have it. Were you ever injured? No. Um, do you recall any? Uh, uh, friends and buddies that you had that you could tell me about? Well, you recall a lot of them. Uh, you want specifics? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were, I'd, I'll just give you the best, the closest group to me. There were four of us, and uh, I just finished not too long ago researching to find the fourth, but one was a fellow named Bill Mannion. He lived in Rochester, New York. Uh, Sam White, who now lives in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and I, and um, who's the fourth? It was White, Denyck, Payne, and uh, Mannion. Mannion was in Rochester, New York. Denyck was in Peekskill, New York. I was in Baltimore, Maryland. And Sam White was someplace in Virginia. Now I know he's in Norfolk. And we were all pretty close. We had stayed together during basic training and so forth. And uh, we were not together. Mannion and I were in the same platoon. Uh, White was transferred out to a troop of 92nd before it was over. And Denike was in the third platoon. Uh, and uh, they were the people that, that I stayed with, uh, you know, when we weren't off on something special. The only one that was wounded was Mannion. He was wounded in the arm. And I have seen him on a couple of occasions since uh, we were out of the service. And White. Uh, Denyck I saw twice back in the 40s, and then that was it. I haven't seen him since, and just recently I found out he had passed away. But they were the ones, and uh, when you think about the, the service, they're the ones that come to my mind first as being friends, close friends. And what what do you remember doing as as friends um, to keep the tension down? Well, while we were overseas, you know, you know, during combat, there there wasn't that much you could do. <laughs> uh, because if you pulled back at night, like a lot of times uh, we, when we pulled back, we formed a perimeter around the uh, field artillery uh, to prevent infiltration there. And you stayed with your platoon. Now I might see the night walk by or something like that, but there was uh, you know, no way of any social activity. When we were on maneuvers and all that was different, you'd go into town together and this sort of thing but not once you got over there. Did you ever have um, time, did you ever get leave? 
during? Uh, I don't remember ever getting it until it was over, though they did pull us back, you know, I guess a sort of an R and R thing, but not leave as such while the war was going on. If they were giving that out, they passed me up. Um, did you have any um, involvement with the civilians during that time? You had some involvement because they were there. Uh, I remember there was one, um, one family, and uh, I guess they were right close on the German-French border. And uh, Mannion found them, and he and I had dinner with them one night. And uh, then later on, uh, one of the biggest impressions of, uh, of the civilians that were there is we were on a, on a hill, and there was a small German town, and the, it was obvious that there were German soldiers there. And the, when morning came, they wanted us to go in there and flush them out. And so we started down that hillside, and off on the left, there was a farm and there was a man and his wife and they were the typical European German farmer type. He was a handsome guy with this white hair and a big white mustache and she matched him with her gray hair and I felt really sorry for him. They were both standing up out there with their hands up and they were as nervous as they could be. And we had no more intentions of hurting them than beans. But they, they didn't know that that was going to happen. We just walked right on by them and left them alone. But then there were other stories, uh, people, German uh, women who would say, you know, that we weren't worth anything at all and that we'd probably killed their husbands. And they might have been right. But uh, outside of that, no close contact again until after the war was over. But while combat, not that much. So, um, what can you tell me about uh, a battle that you that comes to mind? That uh... well, a major one that I'm sure you've heard about now is Hurlesheim, and uh, that was the second time that they took me out of the troop and sent me up to be a, a sort of a radio liaison between the front troops and the the uh, headquarters in the back. And you've heard of that waterworks. And that's where I was in the waterworks uh, with the radio. We had a cable that would run from an, arm, from an armored car a number of feet down into a basement or a foxhole or wherever you happened to be so that you weren't a good target. And I was in that uh, waterworks with the, uh, I guess, the people who were in charge of the operation that was going on. And you knew pretty well the problems that they were having out there. And I uh, spent uh, a night learning all the prayers of all the people that were with me. I learned how to say Hail Mary as a Baptist, and I'm sure if there were some Jewish prayers there, I learned those. And then they, then they got us out of there the next morning. They had no more need for us because apparently we had lost at that time, and uh, they had to regroup, so they sent us back. <clears throat> and. That was, I, I guess, the most memorable. It always will be. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Um, do you remember any of the names of the of the guys that you were? Well, the two that I was with, I had a. Uh, we were in an armored car, and I had a driver, and I had uh, with me the fellow who would have been the gunner, I guess, and he was an assistant radio operator, and the driver's name was uh, Ziska. Z i s k a, and the, uh, the gunner was um, Olirsik, and they were both uh, corporals, T five, which was equal to corporal. And uh, the only other memorable thing is when they told us that we could go. <clears throat> there was a young fellow from the infantry who was coming back, and he was obviously in shock. He didn't look like he was over seventeen years old to me. And uh, he asked if he could get a ride back to where we were going, any place but up, and I don't blame him. And uh, I had to pry his feet off of the seat that he was standing on when we got where we were to help him get out. He was just that tense from what had happened. And they didn't have an easy time of it. So 
That was the key points. That was the high points of it. Do you, um, what can you tell us about, about the, uh, the scenery that you remember um, during the battles? Do you remember seeing a lot of, a lot of wounded, a lot of um, cries or? No, it, that, uh, we didn't run into that that often. Uh, of course, there were people wounded uh, and, and I saw them being carried off. And uh, it didn't affect you really when you saw a dead German soldier, or, you know. But when, if there was an American along the side of the road, then it all became real, you know, that you weren't uh, untouchable, that you, were, that you could suffer the same as they did. But it, it wasn't, again, it wasn't like you see in the movies. You know, you see these, these things uh, where, where the hero runs through 5,000 bullets at one time. You don't do that, and, and that, that wasn't possible there either. But uh, the first uh, dead uh, soldiers that I saw were German. They weren't American soldiers, and they were just laying on the side of the road. But it wasn't that I could look out of that armored car and see people falling left and right, nothing like that. Um, were you involved at all with the, with the uh, concentration camps? When they were liberated, uh, we were, we were in, in one of the towns that the 12th Armored uh, liberated, and my knowledge of really what was going on with Hitler and the Jewish people and all was very limited. I, I didn't realize until after things were almost over. But all of the, the uh, Jewish people who had been liberated were coming out with the striped outfits on and all that sort of thing. And then we learned a little bit about what it was. But I remember seeing them and they would not get too close to you because of lice and all this sort of thing but they were obviously very happy that we were there, and it was a sad sight. But I did not go into the concentration camp. They told us not to go in there, and we didn't. But I remember the huge doors that looked like they were about twice as high as these doors here to this room, and heavy doors that, that led to the entrance. And I remember standing out there and seeing that and these people milling around in, I guess, the square when we were there. That's it. Um, what did you feel about when you were learning it all, learning about it all? What, how did you feel about? Well, that? it was an unbelievable thing that uh, man could do that to man. It, th there was no need for it to begin with, and uh, to just try to eliminate an entire race is just unthinkable, and it still is. And the idea now that that people are trying to say the Holocaust was in somebody's mind is unthinkable too because it was there. There's no doubt about it. And when people try to write that off of the books now, I, I just don't know where they're coming from. What did you, how did you feel about General Patton's um, position? How did you, did you think? Well, I think Patton was probably a master of uh, tank warfare, uh, but he got a, a, a bad reputation when he hit that soldier, and he, he suffered from this blood and guts combination they gave him, you know, his guts and our blood and this sort of thing. But I think because of, of the success he had that every soldier had to like him and cheer him on because the, if he was able to do what it looked like he could do, the thing would have been over a lot sooner. And uh, I think history has proven that if supply had been able to keep up with him, he would have ruptured the German army a lot sooner. He would have broken through and really caused confusion. But as a general, uh, as opposed to other generals, I don't know. Uh, he had to be good or he wouldn't have been able to do what he did. Uh, you compare him to Eisenhower, Eisenhower was a different type of person. So the, I have no real thoughts on Patton. I was sorry when he was killed, when he died, but that's, you know, especially since it was after the war. Um, do 
you remember where you were when they uh, declared the war over? I don't remember a city or a town or anything like that. I can remember what I was doing. We were in a, uh, a small, I guess it was a farm type thing because, you know, the, the, over there the farm and the barn and everything just hooked together and we were crowded around my armored car and we had the radio on, we had the BBC playing and they were verifying the fact that the war was over and uh, of course Japan was still at it by then but you know we figured well we're going to have a rest here for a while anyhow before we have to do anything else and there was none of this jumping up and down and shouting and cheering or anything like that a bunch of them that had grown mustaches said they'd keep the mustache till the war was over so they ran back and shaved and things like this but uh, that's where it was and uh, I remember that and I'll always remember that when it was over just standing there like that and that uh, there was a woman, a German woman uh, about the same time and she came up to us and she said the Krieg is fertig the Krieg is fertig and I said yeah and then it dawned on me that Blitzkrieg meant lightning war and I never knew what that meant all I knew thought was that was an expression but when she brought up that and then another one said oh the Blitz and when when there was lightning, and that's how I learned what Blitzkrieg was. Before that, I didn't know. Now that'll get you a lot in your in your history, but that's how it goes. Hmm. Um, what do you uh, do? You by chance, did you hear the the local music radio stations while you were there? Radio station. BBC. Radio? Okay. BBC is the only thing we got on that. Uh, what was it? There was a, a German woman that was propaganda along with the one in Japan. One, Sally, I think, was the name of one of them. Yeah. yeah. And I never heard her. Uh, she would tell you about your wife or your girlfriend back home, what she was doing. Yeah. No, but I never heard her. It was always a BBC we tried to pick up. Do you recall um, how how far in advance you? you had heard that the war was coming to an end? Well, there were rumors all the time, you know, but um, I guess it was just a matter of a couple of weeks or something that it looked like that for real it was going to end. Uh, when we, we received a sort of an unofficial word that the war was over, we were just about to go into the Bremer Pass and it was snowing and it was in May, but the actual, when we actually heard it, verified it, was in that little farmhouse. You mentioned earlier that, that you had some involvement with the civilians after the war. Can you tell me about that? Oh, well, we were taking their houses. <laughs> you had to have involvement with them because when we went back uh, and settled down, we were in Heidenheim, our, our troop was, and you had to have a billet so they just displaced some of those German families and took over their homes uh, and we lived in their homes and they had to just sort of bunk in with uh, whoever in the neighborhood would let them in. And of course that made them very unhappy and uh, they let us know about it but there was nothing they could do about it. And uh, you never found a Nazi, none of them were Nazis after the war was over but we could find pictures of them sitting at a big banquet table with the swastika in the background and we gave them a hard time over that but uh, that was the main involvement there were also where we were there was a Russian DP camp and a Polish and uh, we got to know some of those people and uh, there's no real reflection on the Polish people because I don't think they were organized, the Russians were, but the Russians got up every morning and did calisthenics and this sort of thing and it kept them right in, in, the, in the beat of things and the Polish people didn't. They just got up and laid around, I guess, and, until they were taken home. But it was a little bit of an experience to meet those people and they were right there with us. And how long were you there? Well, the war ended in May. Uh, 
I think that I was at that particular spot until about September because long about that time they had to keep us busy and they had football equipment and I got on the football team and they uh, moved me into headquarters for that and then that's when they started breaking us up and I was transferred to the second armored and I was just not too far from Frankfurt on the main is where we were with the second. Uh, so I left Heidenheim and that's where I, where I was with the second armored. Tell us about your um, activities and your responsibilities in Heidenheim for that six months or so. You didn't have them. <laughs> it really, it really, you, you know, they uh, they tried to keep us active with with a lot of uh, activities that we liked. There was softball you could play and things of that nature. But I don't remember any. And of course, uh, one time we did. They came out and they went through the whole town and we searched every house for any contraband material or guns or anything like that and anything that uh, signified the Nazi party. And we were to take that out of the houses and uh, everyone was subject to search, though I think we used that as a scare tactic because we didn't do that. And. Uh, that was the one big thing that we had. Of course, we had to keep the vehicles in shape, routine things like that. But pretty much, you know, they they tried to keep you busy with uh, sports activities, and they had, you know, we would have lectures on health and that sort of thing, and then there would be lectures and other things. They didn't just let you lay around and do nothing, but there were no real things that you would associate with. Uh, the fact that maybe we would have been in Japan or something like that, that wasn't. Did you um, take any, acquire any souvenirs while you were there? Yes, I did. I had some great German swords <laughs> and a few other little things and I had an offer of a trip to um, the Riviera. And I financed my trip to the Riviera by selling those sewers to all the recruits that were just coming over. And they thought they were great, they could send them home, and I thought it was great to get rid of them, I could go out and have a good time. The only thing I ended up with when I went home was a, uh, a Belgian 45 pistol. And maybe some little pin with a swastika on it or something like that, but nothing major. So did you, I guess you did have uh, uh, passes for time off? Well, I got to the Riviera because I played football, but uh, I don't re well, you could, I guess, if you had reason, go to a, a city, and I remember I was, I guess, on a pass one time because I was with the uh, lieutenant who was in charge of our platoon, he and I and one of the sergeants. And we went to some little town. I guess he had something to do, but that was like a pass. And we went there and back. But other than that, because they had that no fraternization thing going for a while. Sixty-four dollars was a lot of money, and we didn't uh, we didn't get too involved in that. At least when they were looking, we didn't. But I don't remember, you know, having the availability of passes. And how was your trip to the Riviera? It was great. It was. It was a nice place. I was there in January, and the weather was uh, very nice. It was a little chilly at night, but it was nice and balmy during the day. And uh, the um, oh, where Prince Rainier is, you could walk down there and see part of that, but you couldn't go on it uh, on his territory. And uh, if you knew where to go at night, you could eat steak dinners every night. And we found somebody who told us where they were, so we managed to do that. And the accommodations were nice, everything about that was nice. And uh, it would be a great place to visit now, I suppose. Um, when did you return to the States? February 46. And uh, what was the reunion like? We mean coming home? Mm -hmm. 
Well, of course, when we came into New York Harbor, <laughs> by that time so many of us had come home that they'd stopped the big celebrations and all they had was one tugboat blowing, you know, a fireboat, I guess it was, with the spout of water going up in the air and they had one band playing and uh, it didn't make any difference to us. It would have been great, I guess, uh, because the people who came home first, they really got the reception and they deserved it because they'd been there the longest. But uh, I, I was happy enough. I didn't get down and kiss the ground or anything like that, but I was happy to be home. And uh, they shipped me down to Fort Meade in Maryland. And uh, the first night there, they offered me a pass so I could go in town, but I figured I'm not going into town until I can stay, you know, and be done with this. So I didn't go that first night, and I was discharged the next day. I went on home, and it was nice to be home. My mother and father were both living then, and uh, my wife, and uh, so it was a nice reunion. So when were you married? In 1943. This was while I was in the service, but I wasn't before I went in. There was a lot of us that did that. And. Um what did you do when you returned? Did you just go right into a job or school? Well, within a month, yes. Uh, things, you know, things weren't all that great as far as getting jobs and things of that nature. I remember, I um, because I'd been in radio, I was listening to code on the radio, and I picked up some fellow was in the merchant marine service, I guess, and. He had radioed his dad about how were things, and his dad radioed back, stay on the ship, jobs are not easy here. So that was about the, the way it was. Uh, if you wanted to go back to the job you had before, you could. I think there was a law that dictated that. But I had been in the banking business, and I wasn't interested in going back. So. Did you take advantage of the GI Bill? or? I took advantage of it to buy a house, not for education, but I did do that with the house. I think it got a real low interest rate of four or four and a half percent, something like that. And where was that at? Pardon? Where did you purchase your home? In ba in, uh, outside of Baltimore. No, I didn't either. I was gone from Baltimore. I purchased that in College Park, Maryland, where's, where the University of Maryland is located. Um. Okay. Well, is there anything that you would like to uh, tell us that we haven't gone over? Any stories that you wanted to convey? Well, uh, stories. <laughs> or feelings, or? Well, uh, I, I do have some, some feelings, and that is that when you're talking about that, there, there's nothing there to glamorize, really. I was extremely fortunate in that I didn't see uh, or wasn't involved in a lot of horrendous situations where people were falling left and right and all that sort of thing. And that Hurlishine thing was bad enough. Uh, but my biggest feeling out of it came was, thank God for the infantry because they stood it all, and they're the ones that suffered, and they're the ones that couldn't get back at night. They stayed in the rain, and they stayed in the foxholes, and there was nothing glamorous about it. But without them, nobody goes any place. And, and, and I think it's, despite the fact that we now have all this modern equipment, and they can kill you from a thousand miles away if they want to, in order to win, Someone is going to have to take the ground, and when they take the ground, they can't do it without the infantry. And uh, the most credit in my book has to go to them. Any, anybody you see that was in the infantry and had that infantryman's badge, he's the one. I don't care about your colonels and your generals and all this. They, we needed the brains up at the top, I'll grant you. But all the brain power in the world would be no good without them. And so I say amen to the infantry. That's about it, I guess. Great. Okay. That's wonderful.
Did you have any questions for him? I just have one question. I am really big into the Boy Scout, and I have to ask, did you ever make Eagle? <laughs> I have a good story for you, the Boy Scouts. No, I didn't make Eagle. I, um, I took the Boy Scouts gradually. I liked it. And I would, you know, they had this, um, or you'd go down once a month and you could take additional tests and you go from tenderfoot to second class to first class. Well, I was going along on a great speed and I had to do Nature and Stars. And they asked me, I, I could pick out those stars with no trouble. And they said, well, okay, how about nature? Your observations, does a robin run or hop? And I said, robin, run or hop? So I guessed, I'm not sure where I guessed, but I was wrong. And I went back three or four times. I never did pass that nature and star, so I never got to be first class. I was ready to go in the Army, and I still hadn't passed the thing. But the Boy Scouts taught me a lot uh, that I used while I was in the service. And those people that didn't, you know, just like I said, if you didn't uh, dig that trench around the tent, there was something wrong with you. You had to pray for no rain or you were going to get wet. That's all there was to it. And when I started digging that trench, I said, what are you doing out there? And I said, I'm telling you, if it rains, this is going to keep you from getting wet. So we dug it. The people next to us, you could hear them getting up in the middle of the night and their blankets were wet and everything else. So the Boy Scouts was a great thing. I'd have recommend it to any young boy, anytime. What else did you learn other than digging trenches that helped you out in Europe? Well, you know, you knew how to tie knots. You could, um, could do almost anything. And, and if you were on your own, you knew how to cook something because you had to, to do a little bit of cooking. Everything that that they did in the Scouts, I think, was helpful. It was uh, it was just a nice thing to be in, and uh, <clears throat> I'm sure there were other things that that I used because uh, you're living in the outdoors, and uh, you know even down to the moss on the trees always points to the north and things of that nature. And finding the big dipper and the little dipper, you're not lost. It's as good as a compass, or even reading a compass, and things like that. There were a lot of times, incidentally, going back to the service, that uh, I, I think back and I don't know how, how we found our way, because they sent me back one time with, uh, with uh, 13 prisoners. And they just said, it's back that way. Go back that way, and that's where headquarters is. I Man, I have 13 people. I wasn't alone. I had two other men with me and 13 German prisoners and one fatality on the, on the jeep from our company. But we just hiked on off and found it, and I have no idea how we did it. A couple of times we went back like that. And you just went by a gut feeling, and that too, I think, was an awareness that you got from early training that could be attributed to Boy Scouts, to know where you are and be prepared and things of that nature. You just had to have a sense of where you were and direction. And uh, so we did. Overall, I say I was lucky. Okay? Good enough. That's good? Thank you so much. All right. And I didn't need your water, but I'll use it now. <laughs>